My talk tonight will look at three things very briefly. The Middle East is a region where we have interests and where they continue to be important in some of what they are. Uh, a few of the major challenges that we face in the Middle East, particularly centered uh, in the first regard around ISIS and Iraq and Syria and its future, and then the underlying and I think continuingly most important issue for me, uh, the challenge, the opportunity, and indeed the frustrations of seeking to find a way forward for a peaceful settlement between Israel and the Palestinians, which has in many ways been knocked off center pivot uh, by the rapid, unpredictable, uh, and in many ways uh, quite devastating changes in the Middle East that have stolen center stage. But if you think about the region and you think about the importance of that particular problem, you know and understand uh, that the first principle is it will not solve any of them in and of itself, but it will make the process of moving forward on all of them somewhat more capably addressed and perhaps uh, more easy in terms of the diplomatic challenges that that issue presents. Um, and I will, with some humility, from time to time want to suggest some ways forward uh, and perhaps from time to time even touch a little bit uh, on the international legal ramifications of some of these questions. Um, uh, my contribution to the profession uh, is pretty minimal. I have two children who have joined it uh, and I have a partner with me tonight who has had a distinguished career in the law, uh, a U.S. attorney uh, and a legal counselor to the State Department, Ambassador Nancy Healy Rafel. And so let me, without further introduction and uh, further procrastination, uh, move uh, you all uh, into the center uh, of the Middle East. Uh, put on your seat belts <laughs> and put away your smoking. <laughs> the Middle East has for many years been a preoccupation of the United States. In some ways, an extension of it uh, helped to give our Marine Corps some words for its hymn. Uh, from the shores uh, of Tripoli. But in many ways, we, over the 19th century, uh, developed a fascinating interest in the region. Uh, we set about to convert uh, early Christians to become modern Christians. We set about as well, perhaps, uh, to find ways to induce uh, those uh, of the Muslim faith and those of the Jewish faith uh, that we were friends and not enemies, that we had uh, things to bring to them uh, as Americans, uh, and we left a legacy of great importance, in my view, in what we did with respect to education and medicine. The first hospital in Oman, uh, the great university in Beirut, and another great university in Cairo, and well beyond. Things that in that regard helped to promote what I think is generations of leadership in that part of the world, which have played a major role uh, in the futures of their own countries, and in many ways, the world at large. The region carries much importance for America's great interests. Uh, they have to do with, first and foremost, the loyalty to friends, particularly on both sides of the Arab-Israel divide. And it is not an easy or, in my view, simple uh, process to manage. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to serve first as ambassador to Jordan, and seven years later was called by uh, Secretary Schultz and asked to go to Israel. And my first question was, I said, you know, I was ambassador in an Arab country if the Israelis agreed, and he said, yes, they want you. And I was very pleased because that made me the first member of the Schizophrenics Club. <laughs> <coughs> in which uh, three distinguished predecessors, uh, all foreign service officers, have joined. But it also meant, in fact, that we were looking at the Middle East from the point of view that expertise across the region and broad experience was an absolutely fundamental requirement. And we could no longer afford the notion that people who served in one place 
were disqualified from serving in another, but rather were very important to bridge the gap because our interests were there. Uh, secondly, we have had and continue to have great interest in energy. And while, in fact, recent years have shown that fracking may have turned some of the balance in America's dependence on the Middle East for petroleum, very little of that has so far affected our friends and allies. And we live in a global world. And global trade means healthy and prosperous friends and allies for us as much as anyone else. And their dependence on the oil of that region is perhaps in no way seriously reduced by those changes. And so we look at this in a strategic sense as still very important. It's one of the crossroads of the world in terms of transportation, uh, moving uh, goods and cargoes, uh, and indeed uh, plentiful supplies, uh, and as well intellectual information back and forth from east to west and north and south. And while <clears throat> it is difficult to find the center of the world as we look at the globe, the Middle East occupies a geopolitical position of tremendous importance uh, to us and to many people, our friends and allies in Europe and Asia, in Africa, and even to some extent in Latin America, all have close ties and important relationships there. And we can ill afford to see it become a black hole uh, or a center of perpetual contention uh, with all, in fact, that we see there today. It's a region that is changing. It's a region that is changing in a changing world. Um, and indeed, one of the frustrations has been that while the U.S. wished to pick up in recent years a larger share of uh, the burden in our foreign policy focused on Asia for all the obvious reasons of what was happening in Asia, uh, we found it important and indeed perhaps impossible to move away from the Middle East uh, as some of the uh, rhetoric uh, surrounding uh, the pivot uh, to Asia or the rebalancing in Asia implied. Uh, I personally thought that that was an awful choice of names, uh, that the notion that uh, you were going to refocus attention of a higher level in a particular area did not mean that you had to set it up in a way that indicated that it was a zero-sum game and you were going to have to withdraw uh, some serious interest from other parts of the world, <coughs> whether they be uh, Europe or the Middle East or beyond. But the Middle East, within its own clever fashion, uh, for unpredictability has kept us there and heavily focused on it for the reasons that I have told you. Historic ties, energy, uh, geopolitical positioning, uh, the importance of maintaining uh, our own world leadership have kept us there and, and kept us going in an important way in that part of the region. Uh, to say, in fact, that it's been clear sailing and simply splendid uh, of course, is to bring you in mind of my title, which if you haven't read it, you might look at the uh, brochure handed out uh, to you today. Uh, but I thought that I could only get you here if I talked about muddle, mess, and mission. Uh, I'd like to prefer to speak most uh, about the third M, but you will understand from time to time that I will touch on muddle and mess. Uh, the area is changing so rapidly and things are moving so quickly that we've had grave difficulty in our foreign policy keeping up. If I had given this lecture four years ago, I'd be talking exclusively about the three I-word countries, Iran, Iraq, and Israel, as perhaps the centerpieces of what we're doing. Today, I want to talk about Iraq, uh, Syria, and Israel. Uh, but in a context that would have been entirely, that is entirely different than what would have been the context uh, four or five years ago. Uh, but I will say this with respect to Iran briefly. I had the opportunity, beginning with my retirement from the State Department, now 16 years ago, uh, and to take up with a few close friends the notion beginning in 2002 uh, that a relationship with Iran uh, would be important for the United States just as a relationship has been with People's China or now indeed with Cuba. We don't get to choose our enemies and we don't get necessarily to choose our friends. We have more facility for the latter than the former, but the world is made up of individual states with whom I believe uh, 
invariably we must have relations. And so we undertook the notion that if there are no official relations, perhaps some of us can begin to talk to some people on the other side about the problems between us and what may be the paths forward, and we did. Uh, and we had uh, very much the centerpiece of our concerns, the Iranian nuclear program, as I think everyone did. Uh, and we shared those ideas with the American government and our friends with the Iranian government. We, like a lot of other people who were engaged in that activity, believe and hope that we had some positive influence in the process. Um, but we were all delighted to see a series of agreements, two of them, uh, very important to our future emerge. And obviously, uh, I'm not going to speak extensively about them here today. I have twice uh, here at the University of Virginia run over those subjects, but I'm freely open to questions uh, that you may have that I perhaps can provide answers to. Uh, as a result of this <coughs> rapid change in, in the Middle East, <coughs> in part the introduction uh, of ideas about uh, fundamentalist Islam, um, and its importance to some, uh, and the radicalization of those ideas. Uh, not beginning with Al-Qaeda, perhaps beginning uh, with the, the Prophet Muhammad in some ways, uh, to whom all of the radicals look uh, for authority and certainty in their belief, but with uh, some consternation on the part uh, of my moderate mainline Muslim friends. Uh, it is also true that uh, the growth in what one can call the radical movement has gone through a pr progression of steps and a series of steps, uh, not in, in any way uh, easily separated from the growth of Wahhabism uh, in Saudi Arabia in the 18th century, uh, and indeed, of course, the growth of Al-Qaeda uh, and its depredations and indeed uh, it's serious problems out of which the Islamic State grew uh, in Iraq and Syria. The Islamic State presents challenges not just to the United States and our European friends, but to the whole world. Um, and its beliefs and its radical behavior, and, and indeed its following of practices that can only be called terroristic, uh, present a, an enormous and very difficult problem for us. In Iraq, it is perhaps the number one concern, and it ought to be. Uh, because it has nearly fractured uh, the unity and indeed uh, the continuity of governance in that very important country. Um, and what we can do about it and how we can deal with it is, in my view, a very significant challenge. Uh, first and foremost, I remain concerned by the notion um, that the use of military force is a simple way uh, to short, short circuit uh, the trials, the travails, uh, and indeed the tests of diplomacy in finding answers to these problems. Uh, my own sense is that military force is an extremely valuable adjunct uh, to promoting uh, a negotiating process and to help to influence its outcome. Uh, but to use military force and to expect all of the political configurations that have to take place after that use to drop in one's lap like a ripe plum uh, is, in fact, uh, to believe that the tooth fairy does really leave quarters for children <laughs> under pillows at night. Uh, quarters, obviously, for those lost teeth. But it is also significant, in my view, that diplomacy cannot proceed effectively without some serious thought about how and in what way the political and the military intertwine. And I'm not standing up here today and telling you that the political solution to Iraq is to sit down across the table from ISIS uh, and negotiate a solution. ISIS has taken themselves out of that game. And in many ways, one of the central points of their own belief system is they don't negotiate and they don't deal. But it is not true that politics is absent from the equation. It is very important. And it is simply the, the necessity to assure that in a state run by the Shia majority, the Sunni minority must have a place and a role in governance. Majority rule, minority rights. A very simple concept and a very important one, but one that has slid by, if I could put it this way, the central focus of attention 
uh, of the leadership in Iran, particularly uh, under Prime Minister Maliki. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi, who succeeded him, uh, and succeeded him in indeed <laughs> with quiet cooperation between Iran and the United States, uh, as well as others, uh, because of Maliki's obviously serious incapacities to have the political equation gotten right, uh, has been very, very important in moving the question ahead. Um, and while the use of air power uh, to help and preserve uh, against further gains uh, by the Islamic State people has been significant. It is also quite important that uh, the process on the ground take place. Um, and the United States government believes, uh, for a number of reasons, that needs to be the people of the region themselves rather than outside players. Outside players have created uh, over centuries uh, serious difficulties for themselves in the Middle East in which xenophobia is an art form and the fear of foreigners a dominant characteristic. Uh, and the notion that in fact uh, foreigners play a serious role in creating a recruiting incentive uh, for organizations such as ISIS is a significant and important point to keep in mind. Uh, where are we now with respect to Iraq and how and in what way uh, can the thoughts that I have put forward uh, be further worked in the direction toward a solution. Uh, ISIS uh, is not only pursuing a strategy of creating a caliphate, uh, but is in many ways pursuing a border jumping strategy. We now see that from Mali to Indonesia, ISIS is at work uh, seeking to develop the kind of Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises that Al-Qaeda developed in its own interest. And the relationships are not one-to-one -one or hierarchical, uh, but they are almost willing buyer, willing seller, uh, and they raise very serious problems. And so the solution to the caliphate problem in Iraq and Syria is but one of the many fronts on which we have to move to deal with this problem. So point number one, yes, Iraq and Syria are very important but they are necessary but not sufficient uh, to find an answer to this problem. Uh, secondly, my deep sense is that while there are important military aspects and ISIS has chosen to use military force, um, our intelligence community is perhaps even more important in tracking what's going on and helping us to understand where and how it's moving. It is extremely important that the countries in which ISIS is engaging itself with the idea of mind of taking over their governments and running their affairs, themselves play the kind of leading role and we should be helping and empowering them uh, with the sort of support and assistance which does not put us front and center with soldiers on the ground, uh, but allows them to take on the burden and indeed the responsibility of defending themselves. And so we can help and support uh, at the edges and we can work very hard in our diplomacy uh, to give them the understanding that their future is at stake, but we cannot, in my view, uh, without serious danger, uh, substitute ourselves, uh, particularly in the central confrontation, uh, to make the change. We've seen over the last two years ISIS rapid expansion, some freezing of that in place. Uh, after very hard battles, uh, Iraq troops won back both Ramadi uh, in the west of Baghdad, in Tikrit, north of Baghdad, and has moved further north. And in a hopeful story in the New York Times not too long ago, just days ago, uh, the word was out that we had surrounded Mosul. I have serious doubts that we have surrounded Mosul. Uh, and then it went on to explain uh, that uh, we had uh, friends and allies uh, across the major roads supplying Mosul. And that's probably true. But for anybody who spent more than one or two days in the Middle East and understood the countryside, one of ISIS's great capacity is to dominate the pickup truck market. <laughs> and pickup trucks move everywhere in the Middle East, as we found, uh, even those that are not four-wheel drive. And so ISIS is not heavily dependent on a major and significant logistics supply line. 
uh, and may well still be in Mosul, uh, and we may still be sitting athwart uh, the major arteries, uh, but count on uh, ISIS to use the capillaries. Uh, and so that's important. The second problem on the military side is uh, that we have not, uh, the force in the kind of people who would be most important uh, to deal with Mosul, the city uh, some, at least eight times larger than Ramadi. And Ramadi took a long time to deal with. But a city that uh, both a combination of Kurds and Sunni uh, will have to bear the major responsibility for dealing with. And my own feeling is that uh, we need to think about the military steps as we go ahead uh, because one of our primary efforts uh, is just across the border from Mosul in Syria, Raqqa, uh, where the caliphate has its headquarters and where obviously uh, the political and psychological value uh, of our being able to dislodge ISIS from Raqqa is as important or perhaps even more important than Mosul. Uh, but were we to make a major effort on Mosul, um, and that the ISIS people uh, would half fight to the death and the other half go and move over to Syria is not, in my view, necessarily an easy strategic equation to contend with. Uh, and so maybe uh, the surrounding needs to get tighter uh, without at this point uh, undertaking, for a while at least, uh, the kind of terrifically painful conflict that will be required uh, to recover Mosul. Uh, with its million inhabitants and with obviously uh, all of the women and children there uh, in some ways held hostage. Um, the final point at this stage is uh, we need to look at ISIS where its spear points are going, uh, Mali and Nigeria in Libya, in other parts of North Africa in Yemen, uh, certainly across the Middle East and even into the Gulf states and out beyond Iran uh, toward uh, India uh, and Indonesia and other areas. Uh, because that's where, in the main, uh, the major threat emanating from the Middle East will continue to be a problem. Let me now turn to Syria. And in many ways, it is hard to see, uh, given the fact that ISIS has created a borderless relationship uh, between its presence in Syria and its presence in Iraq, that the two are separate stovepipes in which we can enjoy a kind of foreign policy effort uh, concentrated separately on each of them uh, with no intermediation and no sense of where the question will go. If Iraq is complicated, and it is complicated, uh, in the Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish differences, uh, <coughs> Syria uh, it makes Iraq look like a child's picnic in its complications. Uh, over the last four years of the Syrian civil war, people have counted between 600 and 1,000 militias and similar organizations engaged in the fighting. Some on the side of President Assad, many against President Assad, some allied with ISIS, uh, and some pretty much freelancing on their own. Syria is a country that has a Sunni majority. Um, in the old days, Iraq uh, was a Shia majority country ruled by Sunnis. Uh, and Syria was a Sunni majority country uh, ruled essentially by Alawites. And Alawites have their origin is in Shiism but I think it's a mistake to confuse them with Shia. It is an offshoot of Shiism. It has elements of secrecy in its religion, like the Druze, who are also in many ways closely related to Islam. Uh, but most Muslims do not consider the Druze Muslims. Uh, and they have, too, elements of secrecy in their religion. Uh, and so this mixture uh, in Syria has presented formidable challenges. And moving from peaceful protest uh, to war uh, in the space of the first year, and then against the backdrop of others uh, reasonably new to the Middle East, in my view, who were predicting that given the success of color revolutions, Damascus and Assad would be out in three months, uh, led one to believe that 
uh, we should rely more on our expertise and less on our kind of artificial uh, historical analogies uh, for a deep sense of how to deal with Syria. And over time, that painful realization has taken hold. Uh, Syria has become, if anything, a cockpit of all that is bad in the region. Some say 400,000 deaths. The UN stopped producing reports at 250,000, and they were perhaps the most reliable statistics in an area where reliable statistics are hard to come by. And maybe as many as nine million people in one way or another dislocated, and we're seeing a great deal of that now, uh, moving through Turkey and into Europe, up to the point where it is clearly destabilizing the European Union. Um, and that is just one uh, of the many facets of the problem. Syria, too, is in some ways uh, described in the broadest possible sense uh, by a gentleman who I once briefly worked for, Dr. Henry Kissinger, um, as the revelation that the traditional Arab view of the region that the enemy my, of my enemy is my friend no longer in any way holds true. And that Syria is in some ways a war of all against all. all. We have Sunni against Shia, uh, Arabs against Persians, Turks against Kurds. Uh, we have in many ways many of the tribal groups and organizations uh, within uh, the major uh, divisions in Syria also uh, working out perhaps some of their vengeance and indeed their opposition to other groups in that set of, uh, in, that, in that area. We have a conflict which is enfeebled um, and put huge burdens on the back of Turkey, but even more importantly, Lebanon and Jordan. Um, and so it is, in every sense of the word, as important, if not more important, in, in, than Iraq in calling our attention to the notion that there has to be a way forward. Three uh, United Nations efforts have been underway, first by Kofi Annan, secondly by a former Algerian Foreign Minister, Lakhdar Brahimi, uh, and now by a Swedish diplomat with an Italian name, Stefan Di Mistura. Uh, identified by, again, the newspaper of record as an Italian diplomat. Well, <laughs> if you believe Di Mistura is an Italian name and he migrated to Sweden, if that's possible, and he did, uh, that's an interesting decision. But it is important, I think, uh, to look at the United Nations effort now. Uh, at the time, the Russians came into Syria. And in part, I believe they did it because things were not prospering in Ukraine. And in part, they did it because in the autumn of 2015, uh, both they and their Iranian friends in the support of President Assad became aware of the fact that President Assad had lost in two key areas of Syria the military position he previously held. One in the north, uh, north of Aleppo, uh, in the province of Idlib and the second uh, around Homs and Hama, uh, which in fact sit astride uh, the corridor between Damascus and the Alawite homeland of the Assad family in northwest Syria, what I like to call Alawite Stan. Uh, and so these were uh, dangers of a serious variety. And as a result, President Putin was induced to bring aircraft in and some ground-based support. Uh, and in some ways, that was a little bit uh, like throwing a hand grenade into a bar fight, uh, a, a kind of nasty intervention. And while it was all done, as Mr. Putin is fond of, of, of telling us, uh, under the guise that he was going to fight terrorism, uh, his terrorism and our terrorism were not the same. And much of what he did was to fight the people uh, who we were trying to help uh, deal with President Assad. And so in one way, uh, what he did was to seek at least to present the world with a choice between ISIS and Assad. Uh, and not a very good choice, because in fact, uh, those who early thought that three months would bring a military victory in favor of the reformers 
uh, now know and understand that the military, the possibility of military victory in Syria still remains highly elusive. Uh, but the second thing that Mr. Putin did, which was a little bit harder to notice, uh, was that at the time that he moved his aircraft in and helped to rescue, I think, in the first instance, the deterioration of the Assad position, uh, was that his foreign minister, someone that I had the privilege and pleasure of working with over the years, Sergei Lavrov, uh, was unleashed a little bit uh, to work with Secretary Kerry. And we had the beginnings of an effort that led to two or three meetings in Vienna and Geneva uh, and now a ceasefire. Uh, and so it's quite clear that Putin, at least in his approach to the issue, uh, has one at the same time looked at the question of whether uh, the military peace can be helpful on its own, certainly in saving Assad and maybe changing the military equation, but he also quickly decided that that military equation is not one he wants to be totally a participant in, uh, for an internal amount of, eternal amount of time, uh, but he also believes that uh, it may be useful to be involved in the diplomatic side and that his military participation gives him uh, a serious seat at the table, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, I would not have told you a week ago that I thought the ceasefires would hold, uh, and they haven't held beautifully, but they haven't unheld, if I can put it that way. <laughs> They're continuing on. And there will be another meeting that the Syrian political confrontation around the diplomatic table has been very interesting. Uh, it began with the U.S. and Russia taking a lead. Uh, and immediately, I think both the U.S. and Russia knew that Saudi Arabia had to be there and that Saudi reluctance to be there because of the presence of Iran, which also had to be there, uh, was a major stumbling block. Uh, and Secretary Kerry quietly, and I believe with the full support of the president, got the Saudis to the table. And I think that some of the things that have happened in Saudi Arabia since have been basically efforts uh, on the part, at least, of some in Saudi Arabia uh, to say, well, we may be talking with Iran, but we can still be hard-nosed. Uh, and we can uh, behead or hang uh, a Shia cleric who's been uh, in the waiting room for some time. Uh, but perhaps even use that as a way to upset the process. But that hasn't happened. It was also, I think, very interesting that Turkey was included because it's critically important uh, occupying the long northern border of Syria. And it is also important to the Gulf states, which have played their own role, particularly Qatar, uh, in the fighting uh, in S Syria be, be present, as well as some of the major Europeans. Uh, but for the first three meetings, uh, uh, the dog that didn't bark, uh, the absent ghost at the table was the Syrians themselves. And so very early on, the U.S. and Russia knew they had to work to produce the Syrians. And so they did two things. They asked the Saudis to have a meeting in Riyadh of the opposition Syrian groups who would come uh, to choose a delegation to participate in the meeting. And they asked the Jordanians to take a hard look at the question of who was a terrorist. And the Jordanians, who I know very well, uh, did uh, their usual diplomatic job. Uh, they presented a list of what each of the participants thought were terrorists. No conclusion, uh, but an exhausting list. And of course, everybody in one way or another who had to participate was on that list. <laughs> the second was that the Saudis did get people together and produced a Syrian delegation. I think not all the Syrians who should be there are on that delegation. Maybe some who shouldn't be, but it's important that they did. So what are the next steps that we need to look at um, as this process goes ahead? Because it is, in my way, in my, my sense at the moment, it gets a gentleman's mark for success, C minus. But in the process side, it's probably an A minus in getting all of those people together to stay there and getting a ceasefire to hold for a little bit. So challenge number one is can the UN, which is running these meetings with the help of the major players around the table, uh, push the Syrians further down the road to maintain and enlarge the ceasefire? And the ceasefire is critically important because as you know, it's open to humanitarian relief for people who haven't had it perhaps in some places for years. Uh, and it's begun to stem the violence and as a result, the continued killing 
and the displacement of individuals at the source, and that's very important. The second question is, can that be combined with humanitarian relief? The third question is, should there now become some international monitoring of the ceasefire? Uh, so rather than relying on pr press reports and reports that circulate through the grapevine, we can get something more concrete on the table. Monitoring is not enforcement, and enforcement, in my view, is not an option at this stage, or perhaps at most stages, uh, given uh, the, the, the widespread nature of the fighting and it almost impossibility to contain it. But if those steps are taken, uh, then maybe the monitoring can evolve a little bit into things like the help and protection of minorities as well as monitoring the ceasefire. The second step, which I think is very important, um, and it, it's a significant step in the eyes of all, but all of the major players have accepted is we have to begin to think about future governance of Syria. And this is important uh, because while the U.S. in part uh, to keep uh, uh, the Syrian opposition with us uh, took the initial view that the uh, Western side wouldn't talk about the future of Syria until President Assad was gone, uh, understood uh, the central tenet of diplomacy that unless you invade a country and take over its government, you cannot insist uh, as a price for beginning to talk about peace the results you must have at the table. It doesn't work that way. You have to negotiate those. And so while that was a uh, valiant effort, uh, it was so contrary to, to diplomatic reality that it was not achievable. Uh, and now we've moved on, and so in many ways the transitional government uh, has at least uh, two possible formulas. Uh, one, go out and try to find political leaders at the top who can get to work together uh, and begin to uh, formulate uh, some kind of future government for Syria as long as you can keep the ceasefire holding. Uh, that, in my view, is also something of a feckless enterprise. And that it might be better to start at the bottom and to start with technicians, engineers, uh, specialists, and to focus your attention in the areas in the ceasefire where there is need for humanitarian support, where there's need for medical attention, where there's need for roads to be cleared, where there's need for water to, systems to be reestablished, for sewage systems, those kinds of things. Uh, and they will bring real benefits to the people, and we don't have to worry about what necessarily the allegiance of the engineer is, as long as, in fact, he's not co-opted solely by one of the parties engaged, uh, and we can begin to build that. Uh, if indeed that can be built, then a second stage might be to get some political people together, uh, with or without the technicians, and see if you can design at least a transitional government, a government that, that might assume some of the more challenging aspects for the future of Syria. Um, the third stage would be uh, for that transitional government uh, to look at two things, a new constitution for Syria and maybe an electoral system uh, to ratify that and create a parliament or a constituent assembly. All of that, in my view, uh, just the fact of talking has thrown a cloud over Mr. Assad's future, uh, if not terminated. And the other things that I've talked about are things that will move the country in the direction that I think is very necessary to deal with that problem. Now, let me shift back to what I described for you in the beginning uh, as perhaps the longest standing, most difficult, and most challenging problem. Uh, one that, uh, as Barbara was kind enough to mention in the introduction, I have felt has been continuously governed by the bicycle principle. Uh, the notion that American governments adopt from time to time, uh, that uh, the parties uh, uh, have to need peace more than we do, uh, when it's been described frequently as a vital interest of the United States, is an abdication of responsibility at the highest level. But secondly, it's also very important to note that the bicycle principle is if you're not riding forward, you're falling down. Uh, ever try sitting on a bicycle uh, with your feet on the pedals and not going anywhere? Doesn't work. And that's sort of a major question in the Middle East. And if we're not going anywhere, uh, and that's true then, the area in the falling down has the capacity, as it does now, to produce more violence, uh, uh, deep violence. Uh, and that violence is only going to make the problem uh, worse than it is. 
Um, those who now have told me that the two-state solution is dead are perhaps right, but they've never presented to me any viable alternative. No one state solution, in my view, works. Um, and no multiple state solution is, I think, anywhere near the drawing board. So we're more or less stuck with that. So my sense is, where do we go from here? Um, and I have to tell you that uh, it's a uncomfortable and difficult challenge. But my feeling is that for 35 years, we have been working with the political leadership on both sides to produce a breakthrough. And that has run up against the serious, deeply held differences on both sides in the political leadership. And so my formula is, why not reverse the paradigm to see if you could get things going? Why not produce the breakthrough to see if you can get the political leadership to take a look at it? And by that, I mean the political leadership that has to be responsive, obviously, uh, to the interests of the people. And so it's an exercise that might involve us as leaders uh, taking a look at what some people have said over the years is some simple propositions uh, to define uh, what the major compromises must be between the parties uh, to get a, an enduring peace agreement. Uh, and in some ways, uh, how and in what way that could be framed in simple ways. It is not a diktat. It is not the United States or indeed the United States and its friends um, and others around the world telling the parties, this must be your solution. But it is an important and I think useful idea to think about as a step forward. It's an idea that at a time when presidents are looking at their legacies would not be a terrible legacy uh, to leave on the table a set of ideas which um, in uh, an effort to be balanced and fair but brutally frank with the parties uh, is necessary to have because I think in the end uh, both parties now are caught up in part because of their own political situations and in part uh, because their hopes exceed their capacities to deliver them uh, with a set of ideas that goes well beyond what I think can be achieved in a balanced and fair negotiation. Uh, and so those ideas, and many of us have dealt with them over the years, and in, in some cases some of us, uh, yours truly and others, have written them out, uh, could be uh, a new way to look at a very old problem with the idea in mind that uh, perhaps something that is more transparent, uh, more politically, put it this way, defined in a careful way, uh, could be helpful in a way forward. Uh, my sense is that doing that uh, would help in a couple of ways. One, uh, it would rule out, I think, broad international support for sets of ideas that went well beyond the kind of channel which would be defined uh, by such a set of ideas or thoughts uh, and therefore begin to get the parties to think about, is this really what we can achieve in the negotiation? And to get their publics who are, after all, uh, the people who have to be the major drivers of a peaceful solution in the Middle East, themselves to begin to understand well, what are the compromises. If we are successful at that phase, then neither Israelis nor Palestinians will like what it is we produce. And my view is that may be the best definition of a successful set of formulas, because if we please only one side, we have a non-starter. If we please two sides, we have created uh, the second coming. <laughs> But if we please neither of the sides, we might have put in place some kind of viable foundation. It is also, I think, important that if we do this, we do two other things. We couch whatever we have produced with the simple statement that we, as Americans, will accept anything that the two parties can negotiate between themselves so that they do not understand that we are somehow 
putting a diktat on the table. But finally, we are giving them help and hope that within the confines of what it is we're prepared to provide, uh, there might be a future solution. Uh, one example, of course, is the question of borders. Constantly a tumultuous and difficult problem. But my sense is that uh, the border discussion should start from the 1967 line. Uh, and we should support, as we have in the past, the notion that there can be trade-offs. The trade-offs should, to the greatest extent possible, be equal in quantity and quality, wherever that can be done. Uh, but those are simple propositions. Uh, but they take into account the interests of both sides, but they do it in a way that is balanced and fair. And over other kinds of questions, how to deal with the difficult problem of Jerusalem, how to deal with the difficult problems of security, and so on, uh, there are such formulas uh, that can be very, very useful. Uh, the second point, in, in my view, is we should not count on the parties now necessarily to accept this, but that maybe we can put this in place as something that has some enduring capacity. I've always believed that when you get to the point where you are now in the Middle East, it would be better to do things publicly and perhaps in writing as much as it is to do them privately, which you would do first, of course, with the parties and maintaining confidentiality and secrecy. Because the uh, confidentiality and secrecy approach uh, isn't working. And Albert Einstein once said to keep on doing the same thing and expect a different result is the definition of insanity. Uh, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and I think finally, we have a choice if we want to. Uh, we can produce our ideas. Uh, we can work with the parties on their comments. Um, maybe we should produce a white paper at the end of that stage, uh, particularly if the parties are in this stage cool about sitting down to negotiate on what we've produced. Uh, and a white paper would say what we've produced and why. Uh, a white paper is a diplomatic document to explain an extensive change in position or, or new developments in a broad and careful way. Uh, but what the parties have told us, what we can accept about what they told us, what we can't accept about what they told us and why. And so it's to take diplomacy a little bit uh, out of the closet and into the living room at this stage, which is probably, in my view, necessary. And then finally, there is always the option of taking it to the UN Security Council. Uh, and that in itself uh, has some really catastrophic and indeed some strong consequences. Uh, what I'm suggesting, however, is a legacy approach uh, which at this stage doesn't depend on the parties. Uh, it does depend on what we're prepared to do. And it depends in the most fundamental way on our capacity and uh, our ability to be as fair and as balanced and as equitable as we can with each side uh, in terms of how we see the solution coming uh, and what it would comprehend. Uh, and as I said, there are a number of ideas out there. Uh, a number of people have thought about this. We're not so far apart that we can't define this. But we are only outside friends. We are not interior negotiators. And we have to be acutely conscious of that. Uh, but if this is a problem, as it is, um, that has kept uh, Israelis in a state of constant concern uh, about their future and Palestinians equally so, and continues a set of situations in which um, the areas that are in dispute are uh, continually in turmoil, uh, there is not, in my view, at this stage, another better answer for it, and it can draw a great deal on what has already been done. Uh, President Clinton put forward a set of ideas much too late in his administration that almost got success. Uh, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, uh, during his period, had negotiated a number of thoughts and ideas that are very important. Uh, the Saudi Arabians took the lead in an Arab position uh, that could make a real difference in the future of the region and indeed the future of the peace process. So they're all there to inform how and in what way to put this together. Well, I said I'd only talk for a few minutes and I know I get paid by the words for this lecture, <laughs> but I think probably I've run you over.
and I apologize for that, uh, but I hope that we may still have some time for questions if all of you have not got a six appoint appointment, appointment for coffee somewhere. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you for that and for your kind patience. Uh, I have a questioner down here. Uh, would you tell us perhaps who you are? Certainly. Yeah. My name is Spencer Brackington. I'm uh, in the Department of Politics at Texas University. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke uh, eloquently about uh, American statecraft and uh, all of the troubles that it is confronting uh, in, in the region tonight. Um, one thing that seems to be a perennial complaint uh, of the administration's uh, focus to the region has been an overemphasis uh, toward Iran at the expense of and many people have noticed that uh, the Saudis have been less than willing partners to the United States out of this profound sense of insecurity. I was wondering if you would, might be able to comment. Yes, I, I think it's an important question. Um, and uh, in some ways, um, it is the result of what I would call two or three factors. Uh, one, uh, among us diplomats, there's a phrase, too many moving parts. <laughs> that is too big a set of difficulties to deal with. Uh, the second is priorities. Um, and there was serious urgency, and indeed in Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, a kind of almost joining at the hip over the notion uh, of horror at the development of a nuclear weapon in Iran, and people saw enough signs of that happening to be legitimately concerned, and I joined them. I don't think the Iranians have made the decision, as the US intelligence community has concluded, to make a nuclear weapon, but they were putting themselves in a position, should they make that decision, they had the capacity to do so. So that was worrying. Um, and then the question came up, uh, okay, if you were negotiating with Iran for a nuclear arrangement, why not do a grand bargain and deal with everything? And we already know that the nuclear agreement in its uh, stripped down circumstances was hard enough to get. Uh, would we have been tolerant of a 10 year negotiation uh, to get, uh, put it this way, half a grand bargain, or if you'll pardon the crudeness, a half-assed grand bargain? <laughs> Uh, and so it was important. And it was very interesting, just one insight. Uh, up until President Rouhani's election, the public attitude on the part of Iran was they wanted a grand bargain. A grand agenda, but a grand bargain. And we, for a number of years, said, we've looked at this and we have decided that the nuclear question is important enough that we should not, in a grand bargain, be forced to pay in concessions on nuclear for agreements on other issues. And when President Rouhani was elected, uh, he and his people came to the United States and some of us had had an opportunity to know Foreign Minister Zarif and Zarif said in a small group, he said basically, um, uh, we are in, we've been in the doghouse for eight years um, and that's not gonna be the case anymore. We're gonna reach out and we're gonna do our best to get a deal. A and he said very simply, if we don't get a deal, and very soon you're not gonna have us here any longer. And so, in effect, much of what he had to say and much of what we've done was requited by the recent Iranian elections, and it's important to look at that. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's no future here that the world has stopped with the nuclear deal. My own view is there are two things that we should be working on now. Uh, one is that we should be working on some kinds of limitations on ballistic missiles in the region and testing, uh, because they are of concern. Uh, happily, missiles without nuclear weapons are still a problem, but they are not the cataclysmic problem we face. And the second issue is the opportunity we now have for the Iranian agreement in what I call the most important breakthrough. The most important breakthrough in the Iranian agreement is that Iran has agreed uh, to operate its civil nuclear program in ways that are closely related to its civil nuclear needs <laughs> and not to, in fact, 
uh, activities that could be broadly expanded. Uh, and we know that the famous non-proliferation treaty contained no limitations on uh, enrichment or uh, the recovery of plutonium uh, from spent nuclear fuel. And so if we could take that principle now and apply it generally to all nuclear states, but beginning with the P5, with the Iranians, and with any newcomers, because I think India, Pakistan, and Israel present us more formidable problems, and we don't have to solve all of the problems if we can solve some, that might be a useful way to proceed, and maybe we could add to that the notion that multilateral ownership of enrichment facilities would help to provide more transparency, but you would guard against uh, the proliferation of technology by using black boxes, those kind of things. And we're getting into technical stuff, but I think that, put it this way, there's value in what's been achieved, there's value in continuing it. And the value would be, if we were able to do this, the Iranians would no longer have the 15-year limitation, they would have an endless limitation. And we would all participate, and on the other side of the ledger book, the five nuclear powers have, for a number of years, had unilateral moratoriums on the production of any fissile material for use in nuclear weapons. To take it this step further on the enrichment side would mean we would have an inspected agreement of that character. And that would provide, put it this way, uh, much less capacity unilaterally to change that kind of an approach. And so it is bolting down the moratorium uh, in an internationally legally binding way. 